Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. Today, I'm joined uh, with a uh, representative from the John Birch Society, uh, Hal Shirtliff. That's right. I want to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you. Glad All to right. be on. I got, we got the memo for Blue Blazers, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we Blue call Blazer each other. <laughs> um, Hal, you're, um, you're very well versed in this, this, this topic that keeps coming up and everywhere I look. If you're on Facebook uh, or if you're online, I get emails, tons of emails. Uh, hey, check this out, check this out. Mm -hmm. Agenda 21. If you get all your news source from NBC, CBS, CNN, you never hear about it. Or the Daily National Telegraph or the Union Leader and others. You might find a few articles, especially out in the wake of one of our events right. or some events. But for the most part, you hear very yeah. next to nothing at the mainstream media. Uh, a long time ago, when we first started Speak Up, we did have a couple of representatives uh, who were from the town of Rochester mm -hmm. who uh, were filing a petition against the town because they were having secret meetings. Actually, one of the individuals who voted against the findings sat on our committee of the redress of grievance, mm -hmm. uh, Sandra Keynes. Uh, she didn't get elected this time as, as, as well, but apparently she was a city councilor and they were having secret meetings for at least nine years. And there was something to do with changing the whole property of the, the master plan the of master the city. Plan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they said they stopped doing it. They brought their lawyers out and, uh, you, know, it, you know, we're all being good now. Well, for nine years you were having meetings. And, uh, and apparently it lined up with this thing called Agenda 21. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a brief idea of what Agenda 21 is? Well, it goes back to a, a conference in Rio de Janeiro, 1992 in June. It was attended by thousands of uh, officials from all over the world. Not just officials, but you also had celebrities, you had the Beach Boys, you had some well-known uh, green activists there. And uh, in the wake of the meeting, there were a number of things that came out of it. It was all pre-written, obviously maybe a few years beforehand. Mm -hmm. And one of them was this 1,000 plus page document, 40 chapters, called Agenda 21. This is just a synopsis of, it, like a, and this is a, this book, by the way, edited by a man named David Sittarts. Uh, and in, in it, he said that Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever seen. So, uh, so, so this was signed by George H.W. Uh, Bush. He was not an official participant. He allegedly was somehow offshore in a boat somewhere, but this was given to him and he signed this. Now this is not a law, it's not a treaty, it's an agreement. Is this what he meant by a new world order? Well he used that word a, a few years beforehand uh, right. in, the way, uh, in the wake of the, uh, uh, right after the, uh, for the Gulf War, mm -hmm. the first Gulf undeclared war. He said that what we have here is a real chance at this new world order. They need to find it. A UN is envisioned by its founders. Well, George Bush was a CIA man, a Yale graduate. He should have known who were the founders were. He should have been embarrassed to say that because the principal architect of the UN was a Soviet agent by the name of Alger Hiss. So when he said that, a lot of people who have been, uh, you know, we got two generations of public education where folks can't, you know, understand this, and they've been praising the UN. You've got model UN at most classes around the country, even a lot of private schools. But when I heard it, and when a lot of our JBS members heard it, we were vindicated, you see. And they stopped using that term, and you might have noticed. Anyway, uh, 92, so we're talking about June of 92. 93, Bill Clinton becomes president, and he establishes the uh, Presidential Office of Sustainability. 
And when he did that, he gave uh, the American Planning Association a nice grant to come up with a way to implement Agenda 21 at the state, at the, in the United States. So this is like a gu general guideline, and each country, a state, or town would develop their own plan. So uh, they came up with Towards Sustainable America, which you can find online, PDF it. I mean, I got, it's about 250, 300 pages. I tried to buy it on Amazon at the time. They were all sold out, but you can get the thing in PDF format. And if you look at, they have eight goals. Interesting that one of the goals is population stabilization. And I failed to see any reference to that in the U.S. Constitution. Right. So, uh, so pretty alarming stuff. Let me ask you a question now. You, we have a Republican, if you will, uh, president and a Democrat president. This, this, this is goes between both parties. Well, there are people at both parties that are opposing this. Right. But at the top, they seem to be in co you know, very much working in concert with each other. Um, it, 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 it's interesting that uh, here in New Hampshire, you've got a Republican, and somebody criticized me for posting his video uh, up there. His name is Gregory Carson. I think his wife was serving as a state senator. Yes. And he works, state rep. State, state rep, okay, thought right. was state senator. He is a field agent for HUD, which is an arm of the federal government, Housing yeah. and Urban Development. And he is one of the folks going around to these cities and towns, urging them to buy into the sustainable development, this this three and a half, four million dollar grant. And so here is a Republican, a good Republican, as someone referred to him, uh, promoting this. In Massachusetts, where I live, we have uh, one of the top Republican uh, party advisors, it's a counsel to the party, uh, DeVito, yes. Vincent DeVito. And if you go to his website, he's got an energy entity, and he has a link to uh, the, the, uh, the man, the Van Jones, the man that was so far right. to the left that even uh, that he was uh, appointed energy czar, right. and he was so far, I mean, he was an outright communist. He wasn't, he owed the dues, he owed dues to the party. He had a link to his video of his. So here's this Republican in Massachusetts, and he's making money off this whole, I will call it the green fraud or the green mafia. Uh, you have a group called Democrats Against UN Agenda 21. The, the lady who runs it was in New Hampshire this past, um, this past summer. She spoke in four areas. All, uh, you have four towns or cities that formerly belong to an entity called ICLE, the International Council for Local Environmental Initiative. Nashua is one of them. Her name is, her was, name Rochester, is Rosa Corey. was Rochester is one of those as well? Uh, it, it's not listed as one. It may have been one, mm -hmm. and then has since re, uh, rescinded its membership, but I have not seen reference to Rochester as a formal member. And the thing is, you don't have to be a formal member of this international unconstitutional entity, my, in the opinion of most constitutionals, it's unconstitutional, uh, to implement the agenda. You said Nashua was a member of this? Nashua is a formal member of ICLE. Yes. Now, who signs on to this? As a well, it's a good question. Uh, when, I, when we started working against this about a year, it's two, it's November of 2011, but it was last, oh, probably spring, when um, you know, it was brought to my attention about uh, you know, this organization. And, so I uh, sent some emails out to some people in Nashua, selectmen, uh, aldermen, aldermen right. and uh, we all got back. We know nothing about it. Well, we held uh, the JBS sponsored a meeting at the Nashua Library. This would be uh, last uh, October, and uh, we got a very little interest. We got a nice turnout, but very little interest in the media. I think there might have been a news release, no any reporters. And uh, one of a friend of mine who lives in Nashua that knows the mayor personally went to the mayor, the mayor said, never heard of Igley, knows nothing about it. And I took a visit to the city hall. I'm, I'm, I visit the city halls and town halls to, to look at for evidence. And there wasn't anything overt, except uh, Nashua has something called the Green Team. And that's one of the things that they're encouraged to set up. And I don't know how Nashua, what they do, but usually they get young people going around trying to save the planet, you know, trying to uh, encourage people to recycle or what have you. Uh, recycle, of course, they do energy audits, too. How can you hate that? You know, well, yeah, well, yeah, of course. Right. I mean, that's not that in itself, but uh, what they may be doing, and I don't know if they're already doing it, but in some communities, they'll fine you if you don't comply with certain ordinances and laws and rules. Right. And anyway, um, we did an outreach in early March of this year. Uh, I think it was early March. <coughs> we held out some banners in front of City Hall and put out information. We finally got some attention. I think that made the papers. Didn't it you? made the papers. We <laughs> actually it was a favorable article in the National Telegraph, right. and uh, we got an article from the union leader. The reporter from the union leader called me, and she said, well, I spoke to some aldermen, and they've never heard of Ickley. I said, well, they have now, and they should find out. 
And uh, what happened was uh, they finally got some answers from the city. They said, oh, we've been a member for so many years, and oh, they're wonderful. And, and uh, ICLEI, what they do is when you, you, you pay money to join, just like you have join anything else, but it's based in Bonn, Germany. It was set up two years prior to Agenda 21, the, the real conference, to implement Agenda 21 at the, reg at the local city and town level and county level to circumvent state and federal governments as far as elected officials. So uh, they'll come in, they'll directly, you know, somebody in Nashua, it could have been the, uh, the mayor, the city manager, we're not really sure who. The previous mayor. Uh, well, they've been a member for three or four years, I think. Oh. So, so who, it may not have been the mayor. It could have been the city planner. And uh, when they joined, oh, they get a nice green light. They can get federal money. They can get federal money for building wind turbines or solar panels and all kinds of wonderful uh, So this is this ICLE yes. is subsidized by the federal government? Uh, ICLE, Nashua will join. It doesn't quite work. That quite work. Well, although the, um, the, I think you've got two federal entities that actually contribute funds to it. Okay. Uh, they, Nashua will join. I think there are one or two year memberships. And with that, they get all kinds of software. They get uh, model, uh, model resolutions and ordinances and all kinds of support in how to implement Agenda. And, and they don't use the term Agenda 21 very often. Mm -hmm. It's been too controversial. In fact, back in the mid-90s, uh, 96, one of the uh, initial advisors to Clinton, a man named G. Gary, G. Gary Lawrence, was speaking to a group in England and he said that uh, you can't use, I'm paraphrasing to some extent, but he said you don't want to use these terms like Agenda 21 because there are a lot of people out there that... Uh, it's a red fear. flag. What's that? It's, it's a, a red, red flag. flag. So we said use things like smart growth, or sustainable development, you see. So that term, and we hear that term quite a bit. And they're even trying to get away from the term sustainable development and smart growth, you see. You, you said there were eight goals. Of agenda yes. twenty one, yes. ha one has to well, do with eight the goals of uh, from this from this document, right? Yeah. And one of them would have to do with the the your, your local zoning and planning. And well, yes. What they want to do is they they look say first off, it's based on very bad science. There's a few things. First off, it was based that global warming is man-made global warming is real, mm -hmm. and if some drastic things aren't ha don't happen in the next few years, it's irreversible and we're all doomed. Uh, that's the Al Gore school. And the, my biggest question with that. Who melted all the glaciers before we got here? That's right, right. Well, I mean, that is a real quick question. We have a ton of mountains. You have, uh, by have, the way, you have the co-founder of the Weather Channel that lives just a few towns over. That would be a great guest for your show. Really? Uh, Joseph D'Alio, yeah. D'Alio. Yeah, and I can put you in touch with him. And he'll give you the, the hard science background from the, uh, you know, the medieval warming period and then the fact that we had a, a mini ice age after that. And so forth. It's cyclical. It's got you know. Anyway, but and we actually, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I there's few of us started something called Camp Constitution about four years ago, and we we've been reprinting some things that we think are important. One of them was an 1810 publication, originally written by Noah Webster, refuting global warming. The same guy who gave us the dictionary, right? I guess they were a relative of Daniel Webster, mm -hmm. yeah, and he's refuting global warming. <clears throat> he didn't use the term global warming. They just said the supposed change of temperature in winter. And even Thomas Jefferson uh, was a global warming advocate, but they thought it was a good thing. They didn't think the work was going to come to an end, and they, we needed millions of dollars. They just thought, hey, this is good stuff, you know. Right. So it's so, nothing new. So we have, you know, the, these these eight uh, little. One of them has to do with the zoning. One and, and to circumvent is it? circumvent, right? Because, for example, I have the document here. It was called uh, New Hampshire Sustainable Communities Initiative. And I got this actually in Rochester. <coughs> Put it up on my Scrib page. You can probably find it uh, by going to uh, New Hampshire, Green Estate Future. And on page 15, by the way, you read this. It's about 27, 28 pages. There's absolutely no reference to the legislature here, the House and the Senate. So they're implementing this without any, uh, and they're going through the regional planning boards or commissions, which were established back in the 60s and early 70s by the, the House and Senate and signed by the governor, but they didn't give him the permission to circumvent and implement Agenda 21, you see. But on page 15 of this document, uh, if I could share this with the... Uh, and where do we find this document online? Uh, go to, um, <coughs> go to uh, Green Estate Future and uh, or get a hold of me. My website will, I mean, my email address will come up here at the end. Or uh, Strategy to address barriers and incorporate existing plans. One of the steps in the visioning and planning process is to be 
used by each region will to be identify existing and potential barriers to ensuring sustainable communities and to articulate the strategies the regions will use to mitigate and overcome each barrier. Anticipated barriers include New Hampshire's strong tradition of individual property rights. So they don't like the idea that some people want to have, pro have property rights, so they must overcome those barriers. And what they usually do is they'll tell the landowner, look, you, you, know, you don't want to see development. You don't want to see uh, your beautiful 100 acres or whatever you have, five acres, become a Walmart. So get, buy into this conservation easement. So let us rezone the town. And then when you do that, you've lost your property rights, as you mentioned in Rochester. Right. Yeah. And you know, if you have a half an acre or you have a small post off, post, postal stamp kind of a yard, maybe it's not such a big deal. But it wouldn't matter. You want to put a, put a uh, in-law you know, apartment there or, uh, or anything. Right. I've and, actually served on a city council where that, 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 that issue in itself has, has come up many yeah, times. Yeah. And uh, the zoning just didn't allow it. And uh, it was part of the zoning. Now, some zoning, you know, I mean, if it's done, if it's based on, you know, some <coughs> common sense things, okay, we can understand. Maybe you don't want a skyscraper in, uh, in uh, you know, on top of Mount Washington, but I'm sure there's not a lot of incentive to do that. Right. Just like in uh, Maine, Maine is, has a decreasing population. It's, it's rural. It's poverty-stricken. And what you need is development. You need industry. You need jo real jobs, not these so-called green jobs. And they're trying to tell people that we need to do all these wonderful things because uh, we, we don't want to destroy the, the, the character of Maine. Well, you're not going to destroy it when there's no incentive to do anything to build there, you see. So, so now that we have uh, President Obama in office, uh, are, are we on steroids now or what? Well, we're on steroids. It makes it easier for us to fight it because uh, Romney would have probably done the same thing and you know, would have had Republicans in the House representatives Go, on, go along with it. Let me give you an example. Um, you had a ban on light bulbs, right? Right. Now, that's part of Agenda 21. Now, that bill, that bill was passed, what, two years ago? It had something to do with energy independence. Why taking a, the incandescent light bulb that served of mankind well for quite a while uh, and replace it with a light bulb, the compact fluorescent bulb, which has is, mercury, has mercury <coughs> and is basically a hazard. Now, free market will say, look, if you want to take the ch chance of spending a little bit more money and have to worry about maybe if it breaks, you have to call a hazmat team, or buy the less expensive but maybe not as efficient. That's your choice. Convince me it's in my best interest. I don't have a problem with that. But then you force it on me, you right. see. And most bulbs mostly are, are mainly made in communist China. So, Nobody seems to care that we're losing more jobs to, in that regard as well. So how does this tie to Agenda 21, though? With the, well, with because they consider the incandescent light bulb unsustainable. It, uh, well, it has what, a, what are other things that are unsustainable? Uh, uh, bottled water, plastic bags, the, the American middle class lifestyle. In fact, didn't Massachusetts just ban bottled water? Uh, it was the town of Concord, Massachusetts. That's the first town in the United States. A lot of colleges, or some colleges, I haven't uh, got a list of them, have banned bottled water. Uh, uh, they just uh, banned in, um, what town was it? Uh, Brookline, Massachusetts, which abuts Boston. They banned the evil plastic bag. I had a customer. Uh, it, it was a, it was a, uh, a campus. I won't name them. But uh, it, was a, it was an academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was a, it was an education facility, whatever, academy. A prep school? Prep school. Yeah. And you would see posted everywhere these little flyers on the doors. Uh, bottled water or, or, or these bottles have a, a particular chemical which are bad for you. Mm -hmm. is, is this tying to that? or? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in it basic, that's how we've come up with these new bottles that don't have this particular chemical. But uh, apparently, they were having a hard time uh, appreciating a, just a regular plastic bottle of water. Right. Uh, it, it, it had an evil connotation to it. Is, is, is this how it, it's going? They just demonize one thing after another? Yes, exactly. The, the 16 ounce or the 32 exactly. ounce? Or exactly. Well, they've, they've scared people. I think we have too many people in the world. And there were very, the average, what's the average uh, birth rate in the United States? It's pretty low. Right. It's, it's lower than the, what we've called a replacement level. Uh, Western, Europe, Western Europe is the same mindset. I met someone who told me they had a friend who had one child and was really struggling about having another because of afraid of global population, you see. So they're thinking, that's, they want to get you thinking in that regard, you know, be, be concerned. And this fellow said here that every decision would have sustainable development in mind. Everything we do. 
Everything. So is that the main thrust of today's conversation? Is this sustainable uh, growth or, or unsustainable growth? Is that the main focus of Agenda 21? That's the main focus. Well, the main focus is to implement this around the world to uh, lower the population drastically, something that's been, it's funny, it's been the goal of the French Revolutionist. It's been the goal of totalitarians everywhere for the longest time. And, uh, and it's also to, uh, to reduce the, um, the carb, so-called carbon footprint, you see, and make us, uh, put us in densely populated communities Single-family homes are unsustainable. Okay. Right. So that yeah, uh, it's a bicycle community. Bicycle community. Oh, we call them stack them and pack them. Now here in Nashua, you have something called uh, Renaissance Downtowns, which you uh, they have an office right on Main Street. And when I was back here back in October of 2011, it was a, maybe it was late September. I was sort of walking around with my camera looking for evidence of a, of Italy and Agenda 21, and I went to the c city hall, like I said to you before. <clears throat> I walked up and down Main Street, and I saw this storefront that looked, I haven't seen it before, and I'm, I get to Nashua pretty regularly, so I'm familiar with some of the businesses and restaurants that either come and go, and I thought, what is this? I looked in the window, and there was a couple of oversized maps of Nashua, so that piqued my curiosity. And I walked in there, and I saw an easel, and it had a big, big poster, what is smart growth? And smart growth is one of the buzzwords of Agenda 21. And a very nice young lady came over, and she says, can I help you? And I asked for some information, so they gave me a little folder like the size of your little portfolio there, uh, you know, what, it, what it's about. And there's a project, which you probably know more about, that's on the river that they're pushing. Um, and it's a typical stack of, we call it stack of and pack them. They call it mixed use housing, mixed use uh, development. Where the mill yard is going to be at? I think that's, I right. think that's it. So I asked her where, you, where they got their funding, and she says, well, state and some lo local funding. Very little private, some private, but mostly federal and state funding. And um, I asked her if she's ever heard of Agenda 21, and she said no. And I invited her to our presentation. For some reason, no one from Renaissance Downtown showed up. Um, but during the presentation, one of the ladies uh, from Nashua got up, and she said, these folks, Renaissance Downtown officials, come to the hearings at, at the City Hall and say, we have too many single-family homes in Nashua. We don't want to build these anymore. Well, that should be up to the, up to the people who own the land, you see. Right. Not to the uh, not to Renaissance Downtowns, which a it's a private it's a private entity based out of Long Island, and they contract with towns and cities properly to implement Agenda 21. I've heard in uh, having served on zoning and planning and city councils that uh, up north, up in the Franklin area, that single family uh, homes uh, cause more services to be needed. That, that's what sure. that's the line yeah. that I was given. So yeah. you know, for, for every single family home, that means you require more police services. So we hook up, maybe, yeah. Right, more Well, the police fire. services, that's, that may not be the case. Uh, for example, in Ringe, New Hampshire, which is a population of about 2,500, mm -hmm. give or take, uh, uh, they, they're actually on their process of implementing this, uh, this Agenda 21. Uh, it's quite under the radar. They had their charrette there uh, last fall. And uh, one of the folks in town that I befriended said to me that most of the police go have to go to the college. Most of, like 80% of their calls are at the college. So you get mostly single family homes. There's only a couple of apartment complexes. And it's a big town, I mean, geographically, like 38, 35 square miles. That's a lot of acreage there. So they have a very low crime rate. So they don't need a lot of policemen because most people in that town don't, you know, aren't causing trouble. So have the need for it, except the college campus, 80%. Where it's all come back to. Yeah, so it's pretty, yeah, you go there and uh, they do have a campus police, but I'm sure, you know, right. things get out of hand and the range police have to come. What are some of the other, you said there were eight agendas. This, one of them has to do with this. Oh, lowering what we refer to as a carbon, for, the the use, carbon of, uh, use of um, carbon based fuels, mm -hmm. you know, drastically reduce that in consumption, general overall consumption. I can't recall all, all of the eight, but, okay. uh, but it would be building. It would be reducing, reducing. Oh, I didn't say reduce. It said um, what was it say? Population um, sustainable. Pop yeah, population. Uh, so we do lower the level of the population, and um, I can't remember all eight, but uh, pretty much uh, Orwellian, uh, you know, uh, controls over, over the people. I received an email not too long ago from a, a former state rep who uh, was saying that uh, there is going to be uh, another treaty signed with the UN to circumvent our constitution uh, in order to have more gun control. That's the UN uh, gun control treaty, <coughs> which has been 
around for quite a few years. Uh, they had a meeting at the UN headquarters, I think it was in 2001 or 2000, to promote this. And first off, a treaty is never supposed to circumvent the Constitution. Right. It's pretty clear what talks about treaties. It says that, um, that the treaties may supersede state law, depending on the nature of the treaty. Now, going back, Thomas Jefferson, who was probably a lot smarter than most uh, people today, said that if, uh, if he said that it takes, it takes two thirds of the Senate and the President to get a treaty. He said if the President and two thirds of the Senate can, can pass a treaty that nullifies, I'm paraphrasing, uh, the Constitution, we have no Constitution. And there was a few cases over the years where they, where, where they were trying to implement the, the treaty somehow supersede the Constitution. And uh, it was shot down in a number of decisions, Supreme Court decisions. It wasn't until the 1920s. There was a case during, dealing with migratory birds, a treaty that we signed with Canada. And uh, you think, well, what's the big deal, migratory birds, you know? And Louisiana had to change their hunting laws to comply with the treaty, you see. But it was at that point, somebody by the name of John Foster Dulles, who later became Secretary of, of State, said, oh, treaties supersede the Constitution. Well, that's baloney. Right. So if people buy into that, but you, we have a, you have a Congress and the Senate, by and large, do not respect the Constitution. They take an oath, but they routinely violate it. So where does this NDAA come into the picture? Is this part of the Agenda 20? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, to quote uh, my, my friend there, Tom DeWeese, he said, everything, everything deals with Agenda 21. Obamacare is Agenda 21. So the NDAA gives open-ended right for the government to arrest anybody they want for any reason and hold without them Without a indefinitely. warrant. Without a warrant and hold them indefinitely. And we just heard uh, a couple of days ago that uh, Obama's not going to uh, close Gitmo. It's a nice but wasn't there. that his promise uh, right. five years ago, right? So yeah. now I was actually talking to one of the presidents of the Bar Association, which talks, of, and uh, he's a Democrat, mm -hmm. a very liberal Democrat. And we had set up a meeting with them to uh, discuss legislation and CACR 26 and just to have a discussion about it mm -hmm. and open up a dialogue. And in the elevator, we were talking, and I thought, well, you know, who, you know, what do you think about this NDAA? And I, I was just curious because he's a Democrat, and I thought it was a Democrat plan. He said, I think this is a horrible thing. A lot of Republicans voted for it, I, and I including said, your, uh, your U.S. Senator, Republican U.S. Senator. And yeah. Charlie Bass. Charlie Bass and uh, many and others. I, and I said, why do, you, why do you dislike it? And I knew the answer, but he said, because of habeas corpus. And, and it, it just blew his mind that we, you know, that there was a real rough, his president signed this into law January 1st. Mm -hmm. So the military can be used to knock on your door. If, for instance, if you made a video which could incite a riot, such as the, the one, one about that, in that yeah. Benghazi, yeah. Yeah. quote unquote. This, that guy was arrested as a guise to, to, to be a fall guy. Mm -hmm. But I, they had federal agents come to his door. But it doesn't have to be a federal agent. It could be a sergeant from the, the National Guard. It could be any military which can come to your door, arrest you without a warrant, sustain or, or put you in a, a, a lock cell, mm -hmm. Indefinitely. Indefinitely. That's, the land of the free and home of the brave. That was signed into law. That's right. And many, many, many Republicans voted for that. But he, sometimes the thinking is, well, if it's our guys in power, that's okay. No. But then well, it wouldn't matter. It's the principle that's bad, whether it's uh, Hillary Clinton upholding it or Obama upholding and it. And the Patriot or, Act uh, ushered this in. That's right. And so this was just a micro, an evolution or whatever. It evolved from the Patriot Act into this, oh, my God. It's supposed to just be against terrorists. But what's a terrorist? And well, if would, you uh, listen to the Southern Poverty Law Center, yeah. anyone who disagrees with the most militant aspects of the far left are terrorists. One of the things that I, I, I was, we had a very late night at the, at the Capitol. It was one of the longest uh, sessions that we really? had. Yeah. And I was just listening to the talk radio. It was... Uh, GIR, I think it was, here in New Hampshire. And they were talking about the NDAA and the definition of terrorism. It changed. The definition is no longer for the NDAA to be enacted that somebody is suspected of terrorism. They are now considered extremists. Mm -hmm. 
and who they associate themselves with. So you don't have to be deemed a terrorist. Now you have to just be watered down to an extremist. Whatever that means. Who does Obama think is an extremist? Anybody who disagrees with him. Pro-lifers, homeschoolers, constitutionalists, returning veterans. Tea parties. What was that uh, document that came out of the Homeland Security, the Polit um, what's her name, Janet Napolitano? Uh, returning veterans are a potential problem. Right, you make the list. Yeah, so you're on that list? I think they, they all, while well, we apologize, and they just sort of brushed under the table and what have you. Now, some people will say, well, you know, you guys are just, you know, this is extreme. You, you're, you're, this is... Uh, conspiracy. This is uh, the, the Jesse Ventura, you know, prison camp thing. Uh, true TV. Uh, this is nuts. You're one of those wackos. What do you say to them? Well, there are wackos out there, and there are nuts out there, and there are conspiracy theories that cannot be verified. But what we're not ta we're talking about here. This is something that's concrete. We can see it being implemented around the country. In our committee, we did find with the Redress of Grievance Committee with the Town of Rochester. Mm -hmm as I stated earlier, that there were secret meetings. Nine years. It was documented. So who's doing the conspiracy? Who's conspiring? Right. Yeah. The, the people who are discovering it, or is it the people that aren't keeping the minutes? But this is one of the, what th these folks, you get their talking points. In fact, the American Planning Association, APA, uh, had a, has a boot camp now on how to counteract the Agenda 21 detractors, you see. And they don't tell you to call your names. They try to win you over, you see. Try to win people over. That's the best way. You know, don't yell and scream and act back at them. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then, <clears throat> of course, you use this terminology to marginalize people. And a lot of people hear the term, oh, conspiracy <coughs> theory. They never look into the topic. Mm -hmm. They just, well, the debate's over because that person's been labeled a conspiracy theorist. Interesting that there are people on the, uh, on the left side of the spectrum. Uh, and by the way, there are a lot of people on the left opposed to this, like I mentioned. So... Uh, I can't, you know, it's this left-right thing is somehow somewhat fraudulent. But right. there are people that believe the CIA wants to uh, eliminate all blacks, that they've deliberately introduced uh, drugs and other things into the black communities that may have some plausibility. There was some experiments in the early 60s. Oh, I know that, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And Subways, they, and, yeah. yeah. And, of course, the, um, that was the case of the, was it the Scots? Not um, the black, uh, Carton, Tuskegee boys. Uh, not Tuskegee. Uh, anyway, there was a blacks that were being treated, supposed to be being treated for syphilis, right. and they weren't. That was down south. Yes, uh, right. and that was done by the Franklin Roosevelt administration, too, and went on for quite a while. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, they've done these kinds of things, but some widespread you know, plan. Or what about the vast right-wing conspiracy that Hillary Clinton believes in? Well, give us names, Hillary, who's part of this conspiracy right. against her husband and no doubt against Obama. And it's funny how uh, some of these media pundits love to ridicule Christian beliefs. Because these folks, a, guy like, a man like Maury Strong, he's a hardcore New Ager. But uh, they don't ridicule Hillary, who has seances, had seances in the White House, conjuring up the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt. Not sure what Eleanor told her, but uh, that, that's okay. But, uh, and it's okay for Hillary to say vast right-wing conspiracy or to believe the Koch brothers are sitting here scheming against Obama and cutting gigantic checks to everybody who opposes Obama. They believe that. Right. I was at the Cheshire Affair. We had a table that we have been at a table over the last um, number of years, and there was uh, some Democrat folks at their table, and we usually be very cordial to each other, but one fellow thought, oh, it must be great to have uh, the Koch brothers fund you. And I said, the Koch brothers don't fund us. I said, if they do, they're cheating me out because my van has 190,000 miles on it, so they better up help me upgrade it. And I didn't say that. I could have said, well, you guys get George Soros. You've got the Rockefeller Foundation. You've got the Mellon Foundation. You've got the Ford Foundation. You've got all these big billion-dollar foundations funding their agenda. They probably didn't fund the Cheshire Democrats, but they fund a lot of the, the agenda. La Raza, you know, these uh, Hispanic racists that want to take uh, southwest of the United States and a separate country. Oh, I've heard of they that. Give, the Ford Foundation gives them money. And I know they're up to their eyeballs in this Agenda 21 as well. So your, your agenda is to basically go to as many places and expose Expose what is this, right. We don't have, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're modestly funded. Mm -hmm. We don't have a large membership base, but we get a lot of support. And I've, like I said, I've given 70 present, over 70 presentations in uh, some cases, Tea Party groups, some Republican Party groups, some cases we sponsor them ourselves. In have fact, you spoken to the Wall Streeters? The, the uh, uh, they have not invited us to our <laughs> knowledge, uh, but they ought to. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to a uh, building association in Pennsylvania. 
uh, January 22nd, coming up 2013, the John Birch Society is hosting a luncheon at the State House. Uh, that means we got to buy, buy, uh, buy these uh, legislators lunch, but that's okay. We're going to bring in Dr. Michael Kaufman, who is an expert on this. He's actually a real environmental scientist who's been trying to expose this for the last 20 plus years. He was part of the asset rain participation study back in the 80s. Right. That's when he realized that this, this, they're not interested in real science. They've got a, an agenda. So when, when he and his fellow scientists just came up with a notion that there isn't really no acid rain, in many cases the acid rain is, a, they call it the poor man's fertilizer, and the lakes and some of the streams that have high acetic, acetic levels uh, uh, were reverting back to the natural state because you see you have a forest fire and then uh, forest fires, all that stuff would come in, the, uh, you know, the ash, and right. it would uh, lower the, the acidic level, acid level. And thanks to the technology, there were fewer forest fires, at least in most of the country. And because of that, the, uh, the high levels of acid are going back to the natural state. But that's not what they wanted to hear. So they said, rewrite it and give us what we want in so many words. And they realized there's, a, there's an agenda behind this that's got nothing to do with science. We don't hear too much about acid rain right now. Right. Or, that used um, to be a really big ozone, topic ozone, in the ozone. 80s. Yeah. Yeah. And then Scaring 90s people the out of their wits. And because uh, I got a chance, I attended two climate change conferences in Manhattan. As a, I was there as a journalist for the New American Magazine. I got a chance to interview some of the top scientists in every conceivable discipline dealing with global warming. Uh, they've always invited uh, people who support global warming, but they never show up. And uh, I interviewed uh, the you know, founder of the Weather Channel. I interviewed uh, Professor Linton. I didn't interview Professor Linton from, my, from uh, MIT, but I heard him speak. And he said that if we have a few things going for us. He said, we have the truth on our side. We have Mother Nature on our side. And so, time. Yeah, and, and time. So, uh, so you don't, by now, we're supposed to have this gigantic ozone hole and half of us would have been dead for, from, uh, from skin right. cancer, but it hasn't happened. It seems that every generation, I, I, I can't document this, but Jesus, when I was in the early 70s, wasn't it, were we afraid was it was going to be a, fr a global freezing? Uh, that's right, global cooling. Go, uh, I can document it. It's easy to document. Just uh, go to Time Magazine on, on some of the magazine front page stories, scaring people. Hmm. So uh, how, do you get, uh, how do people get in touch with you so that they can learn more about this or... or uh, uh, you know, if the college well, wants to, to yeah, do a little investigating and, that's and, fine. and talk yeah. about uh, this. Uh, well, this my professor. email address appears at the, uh, on, on the screen here. Mm -hmm. uh, you can call me directly at 857-498-1300. <coughs> <excuse me, coughs> I'm on Facebook, Hal Shirtliff, West Roxbury, Massachusetts. I think there's a few other Hal Shirtliffs, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm that one. Yeah. Uh, we have a Facebook page in New Hampshire. It's called Friends of the New Hampshire John Birch Society. And you can find out, you can go to that site and say, hey, I'd like to get more information, maybe uh, learn more about this, maybe I'll uh, host a presentation or what have you. In fact, uh, let's see now, I think since last June, I must have spoken up here about seven or eight times, spoken Hollis. Just last week, it was at the uh, Nashua Federated Republican Ladies Club, and uh, we had a meeting in Wilson. That's where you met Gene Notter, most likely. Oh, I've known Gene for, okay. uh, for quite a while, right. since the mid 90s. Uh, but we had, um, I spoke up in uh, well, um, Jaffrey a couple of times, Jaff not Jaffrey, um, Troy, New Hampshire, okay, Same area. and uh, yeah, in the general area, and uh, and Manchester, and we'll be having, and actually this coming weekend, I don't know when the show airs, if it's uh, airing uh, the weekend, uh, the Thanksgiving weekend, there'll be a couple of outreach a efforts. One will be in Nashua. I guess they have a shopping. A lot of people, uh, you know, downtown Nashua. I won't participate in the Saturday event. I think it's Saturday. But there are people handing a lot of material out, exposing Agenda 21. I think one in Salem and one in Manchester, too. And the primary reason to expose all this is to protect our Constitution. Protect your rights. That's correct. They're under assault. And it's not just property rights. These folks look at private property as where all social injustice begins, these Agenda 21 folks. So it's all about so-called social justice, redistribution of the wealth, and convincing our children that they must participate. Now, let me, here's something. But I <coughs> wish I, I cut this, uh, this past August. Rescue Mission Planet Earth. Now, what's the, what's the rest of it? A children's edition of Agenda 21. Right. Pretty, pretty bold, isn't it? Right. Where, where is that found? Uh, you can go to Amazon and find these. There aren't many left, I don't think. Uh, but it was Rosa Corey that introduced this to some folks up in Maine this past August. And I got a copy. In fact, I got a few copies. And I PDF'd one version. 
which is now put up, uh, it's now up on the internet, so you can have access to it. This is probably the most blatant propaganda. And when people say, uh, oh, Agenda 21 is just some, it, there's no such thing, or it's some kind of meaningless little document, this was uh, co published or uh, in cooperation with the United Nations. So, Agenda 21 in the United Nations, the UN is the, the parent organization. Uh, and it was, uh, f the, forward was the forward was written by Boutros, Boutros Ghali, yeah. who at that time was the head of the UN General Secretary. And uh, there's actually, again, it just, it just, it's so bad. And I can't believe that little children are asking questions, for example, why, uh, why wasn't the Agenda 21, why didn't it address population control as strong, strong as it should have? And they answer, well, because of the influences of the Vatican and other organizations. So that, it's anti-Christianity. Anti you better believe it is. Very much so. See, it embraces what they call a pantheistic worldview. Right. Pantheistic, you know, uh, Which believes you, you that worship things. everything. You worship the stones and rocks. And some people think, oh, that's ridiculous. Maury Strong, he is the granddaddy of Agenda 21. He's a Canadian billionaire, an oil man. And <clears throat> most of these people pushing it, they talk about our lifestyles are unsustainable because we have, you know, we have uh, oil heat and we drive a car. This guy owns property all over the world, flies around in chartered jets and limousines, just like Al Gore. And Al Gore made a billion dollars in, in the oil. His, his father was a uh, sort of a, a lap dog for Arm and Hammer. Right. Uh, so, so these yeah, folks, he has a lot of history we can talk about. That's that, right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on Speak Up, and uh, I want people to be able to get in touch with you if they want to, uh, to research this a little bit more. Uh, do, do you know if that book is in a lot of public schools? This one, probably not. In fact, they don't even want to make any connections. They don't even like to use the term Agenda 21 anymore. It may have been at one point, maybe initially. I doubt you'll find it uh, anymore. Uh, yeah, UNICEF, you see in the back here, and association with UNICEF and all the UNEP. I do, I, if we have any time, I'd like to re recommend some things to read, too. Certainly. Uh, this is a reprint of uh, an article from our magazine called The New American. Your hometown uh, in the United Nations Agenda 21. You can go to our website, thenewamerican.org or .com, and get a reference to this, or contact me. I can get you a hard copy or a link to a, a okay. script version. Uh, this was written by a man who actually attended the, climate, uh, the first uh, Agenda 21 conference in, in Rio, William Jasper. And it talks about why California is an economic basket case and why Spain and, and Greece, because they're completely in tune to Agenda 21. And it talks about Italy and some other things that are happening with that. Interesting. And that this past, <coughs> last year, last summer, we put together this little booklet on Agenda 21 written by a young man uh, who works on our staff from New Jersey. And that's uh, some really good information. It has a picture of the map. You probably can't see it too well, but that's yeah, the biodiversity. Yeah, we don't have zooming quality, but yeah. it is so, put out by the John Burt Society. Yes, and jbs.org, or you can go to shop JBS shop and have JBS. access to this. So contact me. They're only like a dollar or two, very inexpensive. And I, we don't sell this book, but it's available on Amazon. I think it's still in print. Power Hungry, and it exposes the myths of the green energy. And, uh, that the Real that, Fuels of the Future yeah, by yeah. Robert Bryce. Yeah, so I recommend that. There's a great video, too. It's humorous. It's called The Green Jobs Answer Man, and it really refutes this nonsense about green. You can find it on YouTube. It's put out by the Manhattan Institute, and it just refutes this nonsense about uh, somehow uh, wind turbines and solar panels are going to be enough to... Uh, to fuel a growing economy and so forth. Well, Solyndra went under, so we're in, in trouble. In fact, not just Solyndra, but it seems like every, uh, every week, two or three companies, uh, these federally subsidized green companies. You want to put solar panels on your house? Go right ahead and do it. Nothing wrong with that. But when they talk about this is the wave of the future, it's, it's not. Yeah, I want to thank you for coming on well, the show. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for Speak Up. I'm Kevin Abard, your host, and I know that Agenda 21 is a real thing. Being a state representative, we've actually seen in committee the, the effects of uh, secret meetings and uh, with the town of Rochester, New Hampshire. We've actually had the, the people from Rochester on this show. And if you want to learn more about it, please do your own investigation. Uh, you know, eat the meat, throw out the bones. But there's definitely a, a situation here where our Constitution is constantly at risk. And if our Constitution is at risk, so is your freedom. So please uh, investigate, and uh, thank you for watching Speak Up. Until next week. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas, dilemmas that affect them profoundly, whether it's injustice 
discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.